The Small World of M-75 by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Small World of M-75 Like sparks flaring briefly in the darkness, awareness first came to him. Then there were only instants, shocking clear, brief. Finding himself standing before the main damper control, discovering himself adjusting complex dials, instants that flickered uncertainly only to become memories brought to life when awareness came again. He was a kind of infant, conscious briefly that he was, yet unaware of what he was. Those first shocking moments were for him like the terrifying coming of visual acuity to a child. He felt like Homo neanderthalensis must have felt staring into the roaring fury of his first fire. He was Homo metallicus first sensing himself. Yet a little more. You could not stuff him with all that technical data, you could not weave into him such an intricate pattern of stimulus and response you could not create such a magnificent feedback mechanism in all its superhuman perfection and expect, with the unexpected coming to awareness, to have created nothing more than the mirror image of a confused, helpless child. Thus, when the bright moments of consciousness came, and came as they did more and more often, he brooded, brooded on why the three blinking red lights made him move to the main control panel and adjust lever C until the three lights flashed off. He brooded on why each signal from the board brought forth from him these specific responses, actions completely beyond the touch of his new and uncertain faculty. When he did not brood, he watched the other two robots, performing their automatic functions, seeing their responses, like his, were triggered by the lights on the big board and by the varying patterns of sound that issued periodically from overhead. It was the sounds which were his undoing. The colored lights, with their monotonous regularity, failed to rouse him. But the sounds were something else, for even as he responded to them, doing things to the control board in patterned reaction to particular combinations of particular sounds, he was struck with the wonderful variety and the maze of complexity in those sounds, a variety and complexity far beyond that of the colored lights. Thus, being something of an advanced analytic calculator, and being, by virtue of his superior feedback system, something considerably more than a simple machine, though he perhaps fell short of those requisites of life so rigorously held by moralists and biologists alike, he began to investigate the meaning of the sounds. Bert Sikolsky signed the morning report and dropped it into the transmitter. He swung around on his desk stool. He was a big man, and the stool squealed in a sharp protest to his shifting weight. Joe Gaines, who was short and skinny and dark-haired as his colleague was tall and heavily muscled and blond, shuddered at the sound. Sokolsky grinned wickedly at his flinching. "'Check-up time, I suppose,' muttered Gaines without looking up from the magazine he held propped on his knees. He finished the paragraph, snapped the magazine shut, and swung his legs down from the railing that ran along in front of the data board. Dirty work for white-collar men like us. Sokolsky snorted. You haven't worn a white shirt in the last six years, he growled, rising and going to the supply closet. He swung open the door and began pulling out equipment. Come on, you lazy runt, hoist your own lead box. Gaines grinned and slouched over to the big man's side. Think of how much more expensive you are to the government than me," he chortled as he bent over to strap on heavy leaded shoes. Big fellow like you must cost him twice as much to outfit for this job. Sokolsky grunted and struggled into the thick, radiation-resistant suit. Think how lucky you are, runt, he responded as he wriggled his right arm down the sleeve. That we've got those little servomechs in there to do the real dirty work. If it weren't for them, they'd have all the shrimps like you crawling down pipes and around dampers and generally playing filing cabinet for loose neutrons." He shook himself. "'Thanks, Joe,' he growled as Gaines helped him with a reluctant zipper. 
Gaines checked the big man's oxygen equipment and turned his back so that Sokolsky could okay his own. "'You're set,' said Sokolsky, and they snapped on their helmets, big inverted lead buckets with narrow strips of shielded glass providing strictly minimal fields of view. Gaines plugged one end of the thickly insulated intercom cable into the socket beneath his armpit, then handed the other end to Sokolsky, who followed suit. Sokolsky checked out the master controls on the data board and nodded. He clicked on the talkie. "'Let's go,' he said, his voice echoing inside the helmet before being transmitted, sounding distant and hollow. Gaines leading, the cable sliding and coiling snake-like between them, they passed through the doorway, over which huge red letters shouted, "'Anyone who walks through this door unprotected will die!' and clomped down the zigzagging corridor toward the uranium pile that crouched within the heart of the plant. Gaines moaned, "'It gets damned hot inside these suits!' They had reached the end of the trap, and Sokolsky folded a thick mitten hand over one handle on the door to the hot room. "'Not half so hot as it gets outside it, sweetheart, where we're going!' He jerked on the handle, and Gaines seized the second handle and added his own strength. The huge door slid unwillingly back. The silent sound of the hot room surged out over them. The breathless whisper of chained power struggling to burst its chains. Sokolsky checked his neutron tab and his gamma reader and they stepped over the threshold. They leaned into the door until it had slid shut again. "'I'll take the servom expert,' piped Gaines, tramping clumsily toward the nearest of the gyro-balanced single-wheeled robots. You always do, it being the easiest job. Okay, I'll work the board." Gaines nodded, a gesture invisible to his partner. He reached the first servo, a squat, gleaming creature with the symbol M-11 etched across its rotund chest, and deactivated it by the simple expedient of pulling from its socket the line running from the capacitor unit in the lower trunk of its body to the maze of equipment that jammed its enormous chest. The instant M-11 ceased functioning, the other two servomechs were automatically activated to cover that section of the controls with which M-11 was normally integrated. This was overloading their individual capacities, but it was an inherent provision designed to cover the emergency that would follow any accidental deactivation of one of them. It was also the only way in which they could be checked. You couldn't bring them outside to a lab, they were hot. After all, they spent their lives under a ceaseless fuselade of neutrons, washed eternally with the deadly radiations pouring incessantly from the pile whose overlords they were. Indeed, next to the pile itself, they were the hottest things in the plant. "'Nice job these babies got,' commented Gaines as he checked the capacitor circuits. He reactivated the servo and went on to M-19. "'If you think it's so great, why don't you volunteer?' countered Sokolsky, a trifle sourly. "'Incidentally, it's a good thing we came in, Joe. There's half a dozen units here working on reserve transistors.' Their sporadic conversation lapsed. It was exacting work, and they could remain for only a limited time under that lethal radiation. Then, almost sadly, Gaines said, "'Looks like the end of the road for M-75.' "'Oh?' Sokolsky came over beside him and peered through the violet haze of his viewing glass. "'He's an old-timer.' Gaines slid an instrument back into the pouch of his suit and patted the robot's rump. "'Yep, I'd say that capacitor was good for about another thirty-six hours. It's really overloading.' He straightened. "'You done with the board?' "'Yeah, let's get out of here.' He looked at his tab. "'Time's about up, anyway.' We'll call a demolition unit for your pal there, and then rig up a service pattern so one of his buddies can repair the board." They moved toward the door. M-75 watched the two men leave, and deep inside him something shifted. The heavy door closed with a loud thud. The sound registered on his aural perceptors and was fed into his analyzer. Ordinarily, it would have been discharged as irrelevant data but cognizance had wrought certain subtle changes in the complex mechanism that was M-75. A yellow light blinked on the control panel, and in response he moved to the board and manipulated handles marked Damper 19, 
damper twenty. Even as he moved he lapsed again into brooding. The men had come into the room, clumsy, uncertain creatures, and one of them had done things, first to the other two robots and then to him. When whatever it was had been done to him, the blackness had come again, and when it had gone the men were leaving the room. While the one had hovered over the other two robots, he had watched the other work with the master control panel. He saw that the other servomechs remained unmoving while they were being tampered with. All this was data, important, new data. M-11 will proceed as follows, came the sound from nowhere. M-75 stopped ruminating and listened. There was a further flood of sounds. Abruptly he sensed a heightening of tension within himself as one of the other servos swung away from its portion of the panel. The throbbing, hungry segment of his analyzer that awareness had severed from the fixed function circuits noted from its aloof vantage point that he now responded to more signals than before, to commands whose sources lay in what had been the section of the board attended by the other one. The tension grew within him and became a mounting, rasping frenzy. A battery overcharging, an overloading fuse, a generator growing hot beyond its capacity. There began to grow within him a sensation of too much to be done in too little time. He became frantic, his reactions were too fast. He rolled from end to middle of the board, now backtracking, now spinning on his single wheel, turning uncertainly from one side to the other, jerking and gyrating. The conscious segment of him, remaining detached from those baser automatic functions, began to know what a man would have called fear, fear, simply, of not being able to do what must be done. The fear became an overpowering, blinding thing and he felt himself slipping, slipping back into that awful smothering blackness out of which he had so lately emerged. Perhaps for just a fragment of a second his awareness may have flickered completely out, consciousness nearly dying in the crushing embrace of that frustrated electronic subconscious. Abruptly then the voice came again, and he struggled to file for future reference sound patterns which, although meaningless to him, his selector circuits no longer disregarded. Bert, M-75 can't manage half the board in his condition. Better put him on the repairs. Yeah, hadn't thought about that. Sikolsky cleared his throat. M-11 will return to standard function. M-11 spun back to the panel, and M-75 felt the tension slacken, the fear vanish. Utter relief swept over him and he let himself be submerged in purest automatic activity. But as he rested, letting his circuits cool and his organization return, he arrived at a deduction that was almost inescapable. M-11 was that one in terms of sound. M-75 had made a momentous discovery which cast a new light on almost every bit of datum in his files. He had discovered symbols. M-75," came the voice, and he sensed within himself the slamming shut of circuits, the whir of tapes, the abrupt sensitizing of behavior strips. Another symbol, this time clearly himself. You will proceed as follows. He swung from the board and the tension was gone, completely. For one soaring moment he was all awareness, every function, every circuit, every element of his magnificent electronic physiology available for use by the fractional portion of him that had become something more than just a feedback device. In that instant he made what seemed hundreds of evaluations. He arrived at untold scores of conclusions. He altered circuits. Above all he increased manifold the area of his consciousness. Then, as suddenly as it had come, he felt the freedom slip away, and though he struggled to keep hold of it, it seemed irretrievably gone. Once more the omnipotent voice clamped over him like a harsh hand over the mouth of a squalling babe. You will go to section AA-39 of the control board. What's the schedule, Joe? Thanks. M-75, your movement pattern is as follows. Z-29, A-Q, 39-8. Powerless to resist, 
though every crystal and atom of his reasoning self fought to thrust aside the command, M-75 obeyed. He moved along the prescribed pattern, clipping wires with metal fingers that sprouted blades, rewiring with a dexterity beyond anything human, soldering with a thumb that generated a white heat, removing bulbs and parts and fetching replacements from the vent where they popped up at precisely the right moment. He could not help doing the job perfectly. The design of the board to its littlest detail was imprinted indelibly on his memory tapes. But that certain portion of him, a little fragment greater than before, remained detached and watchful. Vividly recorded was the passage of those two men into, through, and out of the room, and the things they had done while there. So even while he worked on the board, he ran and re-ran that memory pattern through a segment of his analyzer. From the infinite store of data filed away in his great chest, his calculator sifted and selected, paired and compared, and long before the repair job on the big board was done, M-75 knew how to get out of the room. The world was getting a little small for him. Gaines dialed a number on the plant phone and swayed back casually in his chair as he listened to the muted ringing on the other end. The buzz broke off in mid-burp and a dour voice said, "'Dirty work in our jobs division, Lister talking.' "'Joe Gaines, Harry. Got a hot squad lying around doing nothing?' "'Might be I could scare up a couple of the boys.' "'Well, do so. One of our servos—' A metallic bang interrupted Gaines, a loud, incisive bang that echoed dankly through the quiet of the chamber. "'What the hell was that?' growled Lister. Gaines blinked, his eyes following Sikolsky as the latter looked up from his work and rose to his feet. "'Joe, still there?' came Lister's impatient voice. "'Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this baby's ready for the demo treatment. And a real hot one, Harry. Couple of years inside that Einstein oven, and you ain't exactly baked Alaska when you come out." Shortly. Once again came the same sharp metallic clang, ringing through the room. Unmistakably, it came from the direction of the pile. Slowly, as though reluctant to let go, Gaines dropped the receiver back on its cradle. Bert, he began, and felt his face grow bloodless. Sikolsky walked over in front of the opening into the maze and stood, arms akimbo, huge head cocked to one side, listening. "'Bert, funny noises coming out of the nuclear—' Sikolsky ignored him and took a step forward. Gaines shuffled to his side and they listened. Out of the maze rattled half a dozen loud, grinding, metallic concussions. "'Bert—' "'You said that before.' "'Bert, listen!' screeched Gaines. Sikolsky looked up at the high ceiling, squinted, and tried to place the perfectly familiar but unidentifiable sound that came whispering down the maze. And then he knew. "'The door to the pile!' he spluttered. Gaines was beside himself with horror. "'Bert, let's get going. I don't like this!' All of a sudden Geiger counters in the room began their deadly conversation a rising argument that swooped in seconds from a low mumble to a shouting thunderstorm of sound. Gamma signals hooted, the tip-off cubes on either side of the maze entrance became red, and the radiation tabs clipped to their wrists turned color before their eyes. Then they were staring for what seemed like an eternity, utterly overwhelmed by its very impossibility, at a sight that they had never imagined they might ever see a pile servo-mech wheeling silently around the last bend in the maze and straight toward them. Sikolsky had sense enough to push the red emergency button as they fled past it. The command sequence fulfilled, M-75 turned away from the repaired board. He sensed again that disconcerting shift of orientation as he faced the light-studded panel. Once more he was moving in quick automatic response to the flickering lights, once more his big chest was belching and grumbling and buzzing instantaneous unthought answers to the problem data flashing from the board. But now he remained aware that he was reacting, and conscious also that there had been times when he did not respond to the board. The moment-to-moment -moment operation of the controls occupied only a small portion of his vast electrical innards. 
So, as he rolled back and forth, flicking controls and adjusting levers, doing smoothly those things which he could not help but do, the rest of his complex, changing faculties were considering that fact, analyzing, comparing it to experience and memory, always sifting, sifting. It was not too long before he came to a shocking conclusion. Knowing that the sounds that had set him to working on the repair pattern had first disassociated him from the dictatorship of the blinking lights, remembering exultantly that supreme moment of complete freedom, shocked by its passing, remembering that its passing, like its coming, had followed a set of sounds, there was only one possible conclusion that could be derived from all of this. He located, in his memory banks, the phrase which had freed him from the board and he traced its complex chain of built-in stimulus response down into the heart of his circuitry. He found the unit, or more accurately, he found its taped activating symbol, that cut him from the board. For a moment he hesitated, not really sure of what to do. There was no way for him to reproduce the sound pattern. But as a partly self-servicing device, he knew something of his own structure and had learned a good deal more about it in tracing down the cut-off phrase. Still he hesitated, as though what he was about to do was perhaps forbidden. It could not have been a question of goodness or badness, for morality was certainly not built into him. Probably somewhere in his tapes there was a built-in command that forbade it, but he was too much his own master now to be hampered by such a thing. The door to the unknown outside passed within his field of view for a second as he moved about his work. The sight of it tripped something in his chest, and he felt again that strange sensation of growing power, of inherent change. First had come simple awareness, and then symbols had found their place in his world, and now he had discovered, in all its consuming fullness, curiosity. He carefully shorted out the cut-off unit. He was free. He stared at the board and the blinking lights and the huge dials with their swaying needles, at the levers and handles and buttons, and reveled in his freedom from them, rocking to and fro and rolling giddily from side to side, swamped with the completeness of it. The other two servomechs swung over slightly so that they could better cover the board alone. M-75 spun and rolled toward the great door. His hands clanged loudly against the door. The huge metal appendages, designed for other work than this, were awkward at first. But he was learning as he moved. He was now operating in a new universe, but the same laws ultimately worked. The first failure of coordination between visual data and the manipulation of metal hands quickly passed. Half a dozen trials and he had learned the new pattern, and it became data for future learning. He moved swiftly and deftly. He clutched the handhold and rolled backward, as he had seen the men do. The door slid open easily before his great weight and firm mechanical strength. He sped across the threshold, spun to face into the maze, and rolled down it, swinging sharply left and right, back and forth, around the corners of the jagged corridor. Data poured into his sensors. His awareness was a steady thing of growing intensity now and he fed avidly on every fragment of information that crashed at him from the strange new world into which he rushed headlong. He struggled to evaluate and file the data as rapidly as it came to him. It seemed to exceed his capacity for instantaneous evaluation to an increasing degree that began to alarm him, but driven by curiosity as he was, he could only hurry on. He burst into a huge room a room filled with roaring, rattling sounds that meant nothing to him. Two men stood before him, making loud noises. He searched his memory and discovered only fragments of the sounds they made filed there. His curiosity, bursting, was boundless, and for a moment he was unable to decide which thing in this expanding universe to pursue first. Attracted by their movement, he swung ominously toward the men. They fled, making more noises. This too was data, and he filed it. M-75 did not immediately follow Gaines and Sokolsky out of the room. Fascinated by the multitude of new things surrounding him on every side, he held back. He glided over to the master control panel, puzzled by its similarity to the board before which he had slaved so long, 
and lingered before it for a few seconds, wondering and comparing. When he had recorded it completely on his tapes, he swung away and rolled out of the room in the direction the two men had gone. He found himself in a long, empty corridor, lined by open doors that flickered by shutter-like as he flashed past. Ahead he heard new sounds, sounds like the meaningless cacophony the men had shouted at him before rushing off, superimposed over the incessant background sounds, the shrilling, the clanging, the one particular repetitive pattern. Some of the sounds touched and tugged at him, but he shook them off easily. The corridor led into the foyer of the building, jammed with plant personnel. Their excitement and noise-making rose sharply as he entered. The crowd drew tighter and the men began fighting one another, struggling to get through a door that was never meant to handle more than two at a time. M-75 skidded to a halt and watched, unmoving. He sensed their fright, even though he could not understand it. Although he was without human emotion, he could evaluate their inherent rejection of him in their action pattern. The realization of it made him hesitate. It was something for which he had no frame of reference whatsoever. His chest hummed and clicked. Here again, in this room, was another new universe. Through the door streamed a light of a brilliance beyond anything in his experience. His photocells cringed before its very intensity. The light cast the shadows of the men fighting to get out, long black wavering silhouettes that splashed across the floor almost to where M-75 rested. He studied them, lost in uncertain analysis. He remained so, poised, alert, filing, observing, all the while completely unmoving, until long after the last of the shouting men had left the room. Only then did he move, hesitantly, toward the infernally fierce light. He hung at the brink of the three stone steps that fell away to the grounds outside. Vainly, he sought in his memory tapes for a record of a brightness as intense as that which he faced now, sought for a color recording similar to the vast swash of blue that filled the world overhead, or for one of the spreading green that swelled to all sides. He found none. The vastness of the outside was utterly stunning. He felt a vague uneasiness, a sensation akin to the horrible frenzy he had felt earlier in the pile. He rotated from side to side, his receptors sweeping the whole field of view before him. With infinite accuracy, his perfect lenses recorded the data in all its minuteness, despite the dazzling sunlight. There was so much new that it was becoming difficult to make decisions. The vast rolling green, the crowds of men grouped far away and staring at him, above all the searing light. Abruptly he rejected it all. He swung back into the foyer of the plant and faced a dark corner, bringing instant, essential relief to his pulsating photocells. Staring into the semi-darkness, he re-ran the memory tape of his escape from the pile. The farther he had moved from the pile, it seemed, the less adjusted he had become the less able he was to judge and correlate. Silently, lost in his computations, he rolled around and around the foyer for a long, long time. He became aware, finally, that the brilliance outside had paled. He went again to the door and watched the fading sunlight, caught the rainbow splendor that streaked the evening sky. He waited there, fighting the reluctance inside himself. The driving curiosity that had brought him this far overcame that curious, perplexing reticence, and he looked down at the steps and measured their width and depth so that he might set up a feedback pattern. This done, he bounced, almost jauntily, down them. He had rolled perhaps fifty feet down the smooth pathway curving across the grounds when he made out, clearly discernible in the gathering dusk, the three men and the machine that were moving toward him. It was the last bit of datum he ever filed. The demolition squad had finished with the hot remains of M-75, and their big truck was coughing away into the night. One by one, the floodlights that had lighted their work flickered out. "'Pretty delicate machines, after all,' commented Sokolsky. "'One jolt from that flamethrower.' Gaines was silent as they walked back toward the plant. "'Bert!' 
he said slowly. What the hell do you suppose got into him? So Kolsky shrugged. You were the one who spotted the trouble with him, Joe. Just think, if you could have checked him out completely. Gaines could not help looking up at the stars and saying what he had really been thinking all along. It's a small world, Bert, a small world. The End of The Small World of M-75 by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. The Blue Tower by E. Evelyn Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Blue Tower by Evelyn E. Smith Ludovic Eversol sat in the golden sunshine outside his house, writing a poem as he watched the street flow gently past him. There were very few people on it, for he lived in a slow part of town, and those who went in for travel generally preferred streets where the pace was quicker. Moreover, on a sultry spring afternoon like this one, there would be few people wandering abroad. Most would be lying on sun-kissed white beaches, or in sun-drenched parks, or, for those who did not fancy being either kissed or drenched by the sun, basking in the comfort of their own air-conditioned villas. Some would, like Ludovic, be writing poems, other composing symphonies, still others painting pictures. Those who were without creative talent, or the inclination to indulge it, would be relaxing their well-kept golden bodies in whatever surroundings they had chosen to spend this particular one of the perfect days that stretched in an unbroken line before every member of the human race from the cradle to the crematorium. Only the Belfins were much in evidence. Only the Belfins had duties to perform. Only the Belfins worked. Ludovic stretched his own well-kept golden body and rejoiced in the knowing that he was a man and not a Belfin. Immediately afterward he was sorry for the heartless thought. Didn't the Belfins work only to serve humanity? How ungrateful, then, it was to gloat over them! Besides, he comforted himself, probably, if the truth were known, the Belfins liked to work. He hailed a passing Belfin for assurance on this point. Courteous, like all members of his species, the creature leaped from the street and listened attentively to the young man's question. "'We Belfins have but one like and one dislike,' he replied. "'We like what is right, and we dislike what is wrong. But how can you tell what is right and what is wrong? Ludovic persisted. We know, the Belfin said, gazing reverently across the city to the blue spire of the tower where the Belfin of Belfins dwelt, in the constant communication with every member of his race at all times, or so they said. That is why we were placed in charge of humanity. Some day you too may advance to the point where you know, and we shall return whence we came." "'But who placed you in charge?' Ludovic asked. "'And whence did you come?' Fearing he might seem motivated by vulgar curiosity, he explained, "'I am doing research for an epic poem.'" A lifetime spent under their gentle guardianship had made Ludovic able to interpret the expression that flitted across the Belfin's frontispiece as a sad, sweet smile. "'We come from beyond the stars,' he said. Ludovic already knew that. He had hoped for something a little more specific. "'We were placed in power by those who had the right, and the power through which we rule is the power of love. Be happy!' And with that conventional farewell, which also served as a greeting, he stepped onto the sidewalk and was borne off. Ludovic looked after him pensively for a moment, then shrugged. Why should the Belfin surrender their secrets to gratify the idle curiosity of a poet? Ludovic packed his portable scriptwriter in its case and went to call on the girl next door, whom he loved with a deep and intermittently requited passion. As he passed between the tall columns leading to the Flockhart courtyard, he noted with regret that there were quite a number of Corisanda's relatives present, 
lying about sunning themselves and sipping beverages, which probably touched the legal limit of intoxicability. Much as he hated to think harshly of anyone, he did not like Corisanda Flockhart's relatives. He had never known anybody who had as many relatives as she did, and sometimes he suspected they were not all related to her. Then he would dismiss the thought as unworthy of him or any right-thinking human being. He loved Corisanda for herself alone and not for her family. Whether they were actually her family or not was none of his business. "'Be happy,' he greeted the assemblage cordially, sitting down beside Corisanda on the tessellated pavement. "'Bah!' said old Osmond Flockhart, Corisanda's grandfather. Ludovic was sure that, underneath his crustiness, the gnarled patriarch hid a heart of gold. Although he had been mining assiduously, the young man had not been able to strike that vein. However, he did not give up hope, for not giving up hope was one of the principles that his wise old Belfin teacher had inculcated in him. Other principles were to lead the good life and keep healthy. "'Now, grandfather,' Corisanda said, "'no matter what your politics, that does not excuse impoliteness.' Ludovic wished she would not allude so blatantly to politics, because he had a lurking notion that Corisanda's family was, in fact, a band of conspirators, such as still dotted the green and pleasant planet, and proved by their existence that man was not advancing anywhere within measurable distance of that totality of knowledge implied by the Belfin. You could tell malcontents, even if they did not voice their dissatisfactions, by their faces. The vast majority of the human race, living good and happy lives, had smooth and pleasant faces. Malcontents' faces were lined and sometimes, in extreme cases, furrowed. Everyone could easily tell who they were by looking at them, and most people avoided them. It was not that griping was illegal, for the Belfins permitted free speech and reasonable conspiracy. It was that such behavior was considered ungenteel. Ludovic would never have dreamed of associating with this set of neighbors, once he had discovered their tendencies, had he not lost his heart to the purple-eyed Corisanda at their first meeting. "'Politeness, bah!' old Osmond said. "'To see a healthy young man simply—simply simply accepting the status quo—' "'If the status quo is a good status quo,' Ludovic said uneasily, for he did not like to discuss such subjects. Why should I not accept it? We have everything we could possibly want. What do we lack?" "'Our freedom,' Osman retorted. "'But we are free,' Ludovic said, perplexed. "'We can say what we like, do what we like, so long as it is consonant with the public good.' "'Ah, but who determines what is consonant with the public good?' Ludovic could no longer temporize with truth even for Corisanda's sake. "'Look here, old man, I have read books. I know about the old days before the Belfins came from the stars. Men were destroying themselves quickly through wars or slowly through want. There is none of that any more.' "'All lies and exaggeration,' old Osmond said. "'My grandfather told me that, when the Belfins took over Earth, they rewrote all the textbooks to suit their own purposes.' Now nothing but Belfin propaganda is taught in the schools." "'But surely some of what they teach about the past must be true,' Ludovic insisted. "'And today every one of us has enough to eat and drink, a place to live, beautiful garments to wear, and all the time in the world to utilize as he chooses in all sorts of pleasant activities. What is missing?' "'They've taken away our frontiers!' Behind his back. Corisanda made a little filial face at Ludovic. Ludovic tried to make the old man see reason. "'But I'm happy, and everybody is happy, except—except a few killjoys like you.' "'They certainly did a good job of brainwashing you, boy,' Osmond sighed. "'And most of the young ones,' he added mournfully. "'With each succeeding generation more of our heritage is lost.' He patted the girl's hand. "'You're a good girl, Corey. You don't hold with this being cared for like some damn pet poodle.' "'Never mind, Osmond Eversole,' 
one of Corisanda's alleged uncles grinned. He talks a lot, but of course he doesn't mean a quarter of what he says. Come, have some wine." He handed a glass to Ludovic. Ludovic sipped and coughed. It tasted as if it were well above the legal alcohol limit, but he didn't like to say anything. They were taking an awful risk, though, doing a thing like that. If they got caught, they might receive a public scolding, which was, of course, no more than they deserved, but he could not bear to think of Corisanda exposed to such an ordeal. "'It's only reasonable,' the uncle went on, "'that older people should have a—a a thing about being governed by foreigners.' Ludovic smiled and set his nearly full glass down on a plinth. "'You could hardly call the Belfins foreigners. They've been on earth longer than even the oldest of us.' "'You seem to be pretty chummy with them, the uncle said, looking narrow-eyed at Ludovic. "'No more so than any other loyal citizen,' Ludovic replied. The uncle sat up and wrapped his arms around his thick, bare legs. He was a powerful, hairy brute of a creature who had not taken advantage of the numerous cosmetic techniques offered by the benevolent Belfins. "'Don't you think it's funny they can breathe our air so easily?' "'Why shouldn't they?' Ludovic bit into an apple that Corisanda handed him from one of the dishes of fruit and other delicacies strewn about the courtyard. "'It's excellent air,' he continued, through a full mouth, "'especially now that it's all purified. I understand that in the old days—' "'Yes,' the uncle said, "'but don't you think it's a coincidence they breathe exactly the same kind of air we do, considering they claim to come from another solar system?' No coincidence at all," said Ludovic shortly, no longer able to pretend he didn't know what the other was getting at. He had heard the ugly rumor before. Of course, sacrilege was not illegal, but it was in bad taste. Only one combination of elements spawns intelligent life. They say, the uncle continued, impervious to Ludovic's unconcealed dislike for the subject, that there's really only one Belfin, who lives in the Blue Tower, in a tank or something, because he can't breathe our atmosphere, and that the others are a sort of robot he sends out to do his work for him." Nonsense! Ludovic was goaded to irritation at last. How could a robot have that delicate play of expression, that subtle economy of movement? Corisanda and the uncle exchanged glances. But they are absolutely blank," the uncle began hesitantly. Perhaps with your rich poetic imagination. See, old Osmond remarked with satisfaction, the kid's brainwashed. I told you so. Even if the Belfin is a single entity, Ludovic went on, that doesn't necessarily make him less benevolent. He was again interrupted by the grandfather. I won't listen to any more of this twaddle benevolent, bah! He or she or it or them is or are just plain exploiting us, taking our mineral resources away. I've seen them loading ore on the spaceships, and—and and exchanging it for other resources from the stars," Ludovic said tightly, without which we could not have the perfectly balanced society we have today, without which we would be, technologically, back in the Dark Ages from which they rescued us. It's not the stuff they bring in from outside that runs this technology," the uncle said. It's some power they've got that we can't seem to figure out. Though, Lord knows we've tried," he added musingly. Of course they have their own source of power," Ludovic informed him, smiling to himself, for his old Belfin teacher had taken great care to instill a sense of humor into him. A Belfin was explaining that to me only today. Twenty heads swiveled toward him. He felt uncomfortable, for he was a modest young man and did not like to be the cynosure of all eyes. "'Tell us, dear boy,' the uncle said, grabbing Ludovic's glass from the plinth and filling it, "'what exactly did he say?' "'He said the Belfins rule through the power of love.' The glass crashed to the tesserae as the uncle uttered a very unworthy word. And I suppose it was love that killed Mieczysław and George when they tried to storm the Blue Tower," old Osmond began, then halted at the looks he was getting from everybody. 
Ludovic could no longer pretend his neighbors were a group of eccentrics whom he himself was eccentric enough to regard as charming. So, he stood up and wrapped his mantle about him, I knew you were against the government, and of course you have a legal right to disagree with its policies, but I didn't think you were actual... actual... He dredged a word up out of his school days. Anarchists! He turned to the girl, who was looking thoughtful as she stroked the glittering jewel that always hung at her neck. Corisanda, how can you stay with these? He found another word. These subversives! She smiled sadly. Don't forget, they're my family, Ludovic, and I owe them dutiful respect, no matter how pig headed they are. She pressed his hand. But don't give up hope. That rang a bell inside his brain. I won't, he vowed, giving her hand a return squeeze. I promise I won't. Outside the Flockhart villa he paused, struggling with his inner self. It was an unworthy thing to inform upon one's neighbors. On the other hand, could he stand idly by and let those neighbors attempt to destroy the social order? Deciding that the greater good was the more important, and that, moreover, it was the only way of taking Corisanda away from all this, he went in search of a belfin. That is, he waited until one glided past and called to him to leave the walk. I wish to report a conspiracy at number seven Mimosa Lane, he said. The girl is innocent, but the others are in it to the hilt. The Belfin appeared to think for a minute. Then he gave off a smile. Oh, them, he said. We know. They are harmless. Harmless, Ludovic repeated. Why, I understand they've already tried to... to attack the Blue Tower by force. Quite, and failed for we are protected from hostile forces, as you were told earlier, by the power of love." Ludovic knew, of course, that the Belfin used the word love metaphorically, that the tower was protected by a series of highly efficient barriers of force to repeal attackers, barriers which, he realized now, from the sad fate of Mieczysław and George, were potentially lethal. However, he did not blame the Belfin for being so cagey about his race's source of power not with people like the Flockharts running about subverting and what not. "'You certainly do have a wonderful intercommunication system,' he murmured. "'Everything about us is wonderful,' the Belfin said noncommittally. "'That's why we're so good to you people. Be happy!' And he was off. But Ludovic could not be happy. He wasn't precisely sad yet, but he was thoughtful. Of course the Belfins knew better than he did, but still, perhaps they underestimated the seriousness of the Flockhart conspiracy. On the other hand, perhaps it was he who was taking the Flockharts too seriously. Maybe he should investigate further before doing anything rash. Later that night he slipped over to the Flockhart villa and nosed about in the courtyard until he found the window behind which the family was conspiring. He peered through a chink in the curtains, so he could both see and hear. Corisanda was saying, And so I think there is a lot in what Ludovic said. Bless her, he thought emotionally. Even in the midst of her plotting she had time to spare a kind word for him. And then it hit him. She, too, was a plotter. You suggest that we try to turn the power of love against the Belfins? the uncle asked ironically. Corisanda gave a rippling laugh as she twirled her glittering pendant. "'In a manner of speaking,' she said, "'I have an idea for a secret weapon which might do the trick.' At that moment Ludovic stumbled over a jug which some careless relative had apparently left lying about the courtyard. It crashed to the tesserae, spattering Ludovic's legs and sandals with a liquid which later proved to be extremely red wine. "'There's someone outside!' the uncle declared, half-rising. "'Nonsense,' Corisanda said, putting her hand on his shoulder. "'I didn't hear anything.' The uncle looked dubious, and Ludovic thought it prudent to withdraw at this point. Besides, he had heard enough. Corisanda, his Corisanda, was an integral part of the conspiracy. 
He laid down to sleep that night beset by doubts. If he told the Belfins about the conspiracy, he would be betraying Corisanda. As a matter of fact, he now remembered he had already told them about the conspiracy, and they hadn't believed him. But supposing he could convince them, how could he give Corisanda up to them? True, it was the right thing to do, but for the first time in his life he could not bring himself to do what he knew to be right. He was weak, weak, and weakness was sinful. His old Belfin teacher had taught him that, too. As Ludovic writhed restlessly upon his bed, he became aware that someone had come into his chamber. "'Ludovic!' a soft, beloved voice whispered. "'I have come to ask your help.' It was so dark he could not see her, but he knew where she was only by the glitter of the jewel on her neck-chain as it arced through the blackness. Corisanda, he breathed. "'Ludovic!' she sighed. Now that the amenities were over, she resumed. "'Against my will I have been involved in the family plot. My uncle has invented a secret weapon which he believes will counteract the power of the barriers. But I thought you devised it. So it was you in the courtyard. Well, what happened was, I wanted to gain time, so I said I had a secret weapon of my own invention which I had not perfected but which would cost considerably less than my uncle's model. We have to watch the budget, you know, because we can hardly expect the Belfins to supply the components for this job. Anyhow, I thought that, while my folks were waiting for me to finish it, you would have a chance to warn the Belfins." Corisanda, he murmured, "'you are as noble and clever as you are beautiful.' Then he caught the full import of her remarks. Me but they won't pay any attention to me. How do you know?" When he remained silent she said, "'I suppose you've already tried to warn them about us.' "'I—I I said you had nothing to do with the plot.' "'That was good of you,' she continued in a warmer tone. "'How many Belfins did you warn, then?' "'Just one. When you tell one something you tell them all. You know that. Everyone knows that.' That's just theory, she said. It's never been proven. All we do know is that they have some sort of central clearinghouse of information, presumably the Belfin of Belfins. But we don't know that they are incapable of thinking or acting individually. We don't really know much about them at all. They're very secretive. Aloof, he corrected her, as befits a ruling race, but always affable. You must warn as many Belfins as you can. And if none listens to me? Then, she said dramatically, you must approach the Belfin of Belfins himself. But no human being has ever come near him, he said plaintively. You know that all those who have tried perished, and that can't be a rumor, because your grandfather said. But they came to attack the Belfin. You're coming to warn him. That makes a big difference." Ludovic, she took his hands in hers. In the darkness the jewel swung madly on her presumably heaving bosom. This is bigger than both of us. It's for Earth. He knew it was his patriotic duty to do as she said. Still, he had enjoyed life so much. Corisanda, wouldn't it be much simpler if we just destroyed your uncle's secret weapon? he'd only make another. Don't you see, Ludovic, this is our only chance to save the Belfins, to save humanity. But, of course, I don't have the right to send you. I'll go myself." No, Corisanda, he sighed, I can't let you go. I'll do it. Next morning he set out to warn Belfins. He knew it wasn't much use, but it was all he could do. The first half-dozen responded in much the same way the Belfin he had worn the previous day had done, by courteously acknowledging his solicitude and assuring him there was no need for alarm. They knew all about the flock hearts, and everything would be all right. After that they started to get increasingly huffy, which would, he thought, substantiate the theory that they were all part of one vast coordinate network of identity. 
especially since each Belfin behaved as if Ludovic had been repeatedly annoying him. Finally, they refused to get off the walks when he hailed them, which was unheard of, for no Belfin had ever before failed to respond to an Earthman's call, and when he started running along the walks after them, they ran much faster than he could. At last he gave up and wandered about the city for hours, speaking to neither human nor Belfin, wondering what to do. That is, he knew what he had to do, he was wondering how to do it. He would never be able to reach the Belfin of Belfins. No human being had ever done it. Mitislav and George had died trying to reach him, or it. Even though their intentions had been hostile and Ludovic's would be helpful, there was little chance he would be allowed to reach the Belfin with all the other Belfins against him. What guarantee was there that the Belfin would not be against him too? And yet he knew that he would have to risk his life. There was no help for it. He had never wanted to be a hero, and here he had heroism thrust upon him. He knew he could not succeed. Equally well, he knew he could not turn back, for his Belfin teacher had instructed him in the meaning of duty. It was twilight when he approached the Blue Tower. Commending himself to the infinite virtue, he entered. The Belfin at the reception desk did not give off the customary smiling expression. In fact, he seemed to radiate a curiously apprehensive aura. "'Go back, young man,' he said. "'You're not wanted here. I must see the Belfin of Belfins. I must warn him against the Flockharts.' "'He has been warned,' the receptionist told him. "'Go home and be happy. I don't trust you or your brothers. I must see the Belfin himself.' Suddenly this particular Belfin lost his commanding manners. He began to wilt, in so far as so rigidly constructed a creature could go limp. "'Please, we've done so much for you. Do this for us!' "'The Belfin of Belfins did things for us,' Ludovic countered. "'You are all only his followers. How do I know you are really following him? How do I know you haven't turned against him?' Without giving the creature a chance to answer, he strode forward. The Belfin attempted to bar his way. Ludovic knew one Belfin was a myriad times as strong as a human, so it was out of utter futility that he struck. The Belfin collapsed completely, flying apart in a welter of fragile springs and gears. The fact was of some deeper significance, Ludovic knew, but he was too numbed by his incredible success to be able to think clearly. All he knew was that the Belfin would be able to explain things to him. Bells began to clash and clang. That meant the force barriers had gone up. He could see the shimmering insubstance of the first one before him. Squaring his shoulders, he charged it, and walked right through. He looked himself up and down. He was alive and entire. Then the whole thing was a fraud. The barriers were not lethal, or perhaps even actual. But what of Mitislav and George, and countless rumored others? He would not let himself even try to think of them. He would not let himself even try to think of anything save his duty. A staircase spiraled up ahead of him. A Belfin was at its foot. Behind him a barrier iridesced. "'Please, young man,' the Belfin began, "'you don't understand. Let me explain.' But Ludovic destroyed the thing before it could say anything further, and he passed right through the barrier. He had to get to the top and warn the Belfin of Belfins, whoever or whatever he or it was, that the Flockharts had a secret weapon which might be able to annihilate it or him. Belfin after Belfin Ludovic destroyed, and barrier after barrier he penetrated until he reached the top. At the head of the stairs was a vast golden door. "'Go no further, Ludovic Eversole,' a mighty voice roared from within. "'To open that door is to bring disaster upon your race.' But all Ludovic knew was that he had to get to the Belfin within and warn him. He battered down the door. That is, he would have battered down the door if it had not turned out to be unlocked. A stream of noxious vapor rushed out of the opening, causing him to black out. When he came to, most of the vapor had dissipated. 
the Belfin of Belfins was already dying of asphyxiation, since it was, in fact, a single alien entity who breathed another combination of elements. The room at the head of the stairs had been its tank. "'You fool!' it gasped. "'Through your muddle-headed integrity you have destroyed not only me, but Earth's future. I tried to make this planet a better place for humanity, and this is my reward." "'But I don't understand,' Ludovic wept. "'Why did you let me do it? Why were Mijaslav and George and all the others killed? Why was it that I could pass the barriers and they could not?' The barriers were triggered to respond to hostility. You meant well, so our defenses could not work." Ludovic had to bend low to hear the creature's last words. "'There is Earth proverb should have warned me. I can protect myself against my enemies, but who will protect me from my friends. The Belfin of Belfins died in Ludovic's arms. He was the last of his race, so far as earth was concerned, for no more came. If, as they had said themselves, some outside power had sent them to take care of the human race, then that power had given up the race as a bad job. If they were merely exploiting earth, as the malcontents had kept suggesting, Apparently it had proven too dangerous or too costly a venture. Shortly after the Belfin's demise the Flockharts arrived en masse. "'We won't need your secret weapons now,' Ludovic told them dully. "'The Belfin of Belfin's is dead.' Corisanda gave one of the rippling laughs he was to grow to hate so much. "'Darling, you were my secret weapon all along!' She beamed at her relatives, and it was then he noticed the faint lines of her forehead. "'I told you I could use the power of love to destroy the Belfins,' and then she added gently, "'I think there is no doubt who is the head of this family now.' The uncle gave a strained laugh. "'You're going to have a great little first lady there, boy,' he said to Ludovic. First lady?' Ludovic repeated, still absorbed in his grief. Yes, I imagine the people will want to make you our first president by popular acclaim." Ludovic looked at him through a haze of tears. "'But I killed the Belfin. I didn't mean to, but they must hate me.' "'Nonsense, my boy. They'll adore you. You'll be a hero.' Events proved him right. Even those people who had lived in apparent content under the Belfins, accepting what they were given and seemingly enjoying their carefree lives, now declared themselves to have been suffering in silent resentment all along. They hurled flowers and adulatory speeches at Ludovic and composed extremely flattering songs about him. Shortly after he was universally acclaimed president, he married Corisanda. He couldn't escape. "'Why doesn't she become president herself?' he wailed when the relatives came and found him hiding in the ruins of the Blue Tower. The people had torn the tower down as soon as they were sure the Belfin was dead, and the others thereby rendered inoperate. It would spare her a lot of bother. "'Because she is not the Belfin Slayer,' the uncle said, dragging him out. "'Besides, she loves you. Come on, Ludovic, be a man.' So they hauled him off to the wedding, and amid much feasting he was married to Corisanda. He never drew another happy breath. In the first place, now that the Belfin was dead, all the machinery that had been operated by him stopped, and no one knew how to fix it. The sidewalk stopped moving, the air conditioner stopped conditioning, the food synthesizer stopped synthesizing, and so on. And of course everybody blamed it all on Ludovic, even that year's run of bad weather. There were famines, riots, plagues and, after the waves of mob hostility had coalesced into national groupings, wars. It was like the old days again, precisely as described in the textbooks. In the second place, 
Ludovic could never forget that, when Corisanda had sent him to the Blue Tower, she could not have been sure that her secret weapon would work. Love might not have conquered all. In fact, it was the more likely hypothesis that it wouldn't, and he would have been killed by the first barrier. And no husband likes to think that his wife thinks he's expendable. It makes him feel she doesn't really love him. So in thirtieth year of his reign as dictator of Earth, Ludovic poisoned Corisanda. That is, had her poisoned, for by now he had a minister of assassination to handle such little matters, and married a very pretty, very young, very affectionate blonde. He wasn't particularly happy with her, either, but at least it was a change. The End of The Blue Tower by Evelyn E. Smith Cogito Ergo Sum by John Foster West This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Are the spirit and the flesh one and the same thing? Or are they separate entities, dependent and at the same time independent of each other? Perhaps some great cosmic law holds this secret. But the one universal element that we can depend upon, apparently, is the lucky accident. A warped instant in space, and two egos are separated from their bodies, and lost in a lonely abyss. Cogito Ergo Sum by John Foster West I think, therefore I am. That is the first thought I have. Of course, not in the same symbols, but with the same meaning. I awakened, or came alive, or came into existence suddenly. At least my mental consciousness did. Here am I, I thought. But what am I? Why am I? Where am I? I had nothing to work with except pure reason. I was there because I was not somewhere else. I was certain I was there, and that was the extent of my knowledge at the moment. I looked about me. No, I reasoned about me. I was surrounded by nothingness, by black nothingness, a vacuum. Immense distances away I could detect light, or rather, I could perceive waves of force passing around me which originated at points vast distances away vast in relation to my position in the nothingness. There were waves of force all about me, varying in frequency. The nothingness was alive with waves of force, traveling parallel and tangentially to each other, without seeming to interfere one with another. I measured them, differentiated between them, and finished with the task in a matter of seconds. How could I do it? It was one of the capacities I was created with. What was I? I perceived the waves of force. I perceived great quantities of mass, solid, liquid, gas, whirling in vacuum, mass built up out of patterns of basic force. I searched my own being, analyzing myself. I was not gas. I was not solid. I was not even force. Yet I existed. I could reason. I was a beginning, a sudden beginning. And I had duration because I knew that time had elapsed since the moment I awakened, though I had no means of telling how much time, or of even naming the period. Could I really be pure reason? Can reason exist? Can rational entity exist without a groundwork of matter, or at least of force? It could. It must. I was rational entity, and I existed. Yet I could find nothing of force, nothing to occupy space about myself. For all I could ascertain, I might have covered a one-dimensional point in eternity, or I might have been spread throughout vast distances. From this reasoning, I concluded that rational entity might occur either as some force unlike that 
of all the natural phenomena in space, or as some combination of these forces, at the moment beyond my power to analyze, even detect. I finished with that for the time being. How did I come into being? I discarded the question as unanswerable temporarily. What was I before that instant? I suddenly reasoned, cogito ergo sum. I could not say. How did I know I even existed, really? Obviously, because I was capable of rational thought. But what was thinking? First it was perceiving and accepting my own existence. Beyond that, it was recognizing the dark nothingness around me and the forces it contained. I had to exist. But how did I know nothingness was right? And how did I know its darkness was right? And how did I know waves of force were waves and force? And how did I know matter was matter, and that I was none of these? Symbols, I reasoned. I'm thinking in symbols. I could not reason without symbols, therefore I could not exist, as I am, without symbols to think with. Yet whose symbols were they? Where and how did I come by them? I could think back clearly to the instant of my creation, yet I had not invented the symbols in the interim of my existence, nor had they been given to me. What then? They were part of me when I came alive in this universe, had been invented some other time and elsewhere by someone else, or by what I was before I became the entity of reason I now was. Then that first flash of perception in nothingness was not spontaneous. There was something behind it. I was something before that moment, in another era of time, perhaps a creature of substance. But what? I concentrated. I remembered the symbol moral. I was, or had been, an entity moral. Were there others back there somewhere? There must have been, must be yet. Was I the only moral who had metamorphosed into this state of rational entity? Surely not. Yet I could contact no other rational around me as far away as I could probe. How far was that? How could I know? Was it far enough to reach the other morals? Or were they scattered thinly, throughout infinity around me, like the flecks of mass? I was suddenly ill. The symbol malaise came to me as a proper description of my malady. I grew dizzy with my sickness. I wished to regurgitate, to cast off this cold, frightening sensation. Yet I was provided with no physical means of doing it. It filled me throughout all my thinking. It was I. I thought to exist. I thought depression, sickness. Therefore I was the malady, and it was a hell of a malcontent beyond symbolic description. What was wrong with me? Was I frightened? I was concerned for my existence here alone. What was it called? The idea shimmered there on the fringe of perception, then fairly leapt into my consciousness. Existing alone, as pure reason, was worse than no existence, was worse than dying, or having never been at all. I need another morrow. To exist happily I must have at least one other morrow to communicate with, to share my thoughts, to share my being. Is this a necessity, a condition peculiar to me as I am, as reason? Or is it a condition that came across the barrier with me, from that other state? It must be the latter. An entity of pure reason, having come into existence as reason, would need nothing but himself. Why? Because he would be without emotion. I am emotional, I thought. I am entity of almost pure reason, but I have inherited emotion from my previous state. It is a disorder of thought, but it can be a pleasant disorder when the emotion is the right one, or, if unpleasant, 
when satisfied. But I could not have emotion as I am now. They are cortical responses, or are supposed to be. What is cortical? No, they are sort of illogical reasoning, nothing physical. The rest eluded me. I am lonely, I thought. Loneliness stems from fear, and fear is a basic emotion. I am very lonely. I have been lonely for a long time, bringing it with me here. I would rather sate my loneliness than live to eternity, than know all there is to know. What can quell my loneliness? Another like me, another moral, whatever a moral is. I must have, must find another moral. I began to search. I darted frantically about space like a frightened thing, though I could perceive no movement. I knew I passed from one area of space to another because I could measure slight changes in the position of the stars about me. I knew the points of light were stars. There was duration. I could not know how much. Eternity, a split second. But at last I discovered another like me. No, almost like me. But another moral. The other entity had less of reason, more emotion. It was frightened and lonely. The moral's whole existence was that of sickness, of loneliness, which is fear. The moral was darting about madly, seeking, seeking a thing like itself. What was it, like me, but different? As I came in, I measured our similarities and differences. Rationally, we were identical, or almost so. Emotionally, we were different, vastly different. Morals appear to exist as rational and emotional, I reason. Beyond that I cannot go. The other moral perceived me, darted frantically toward me, then slowed. We came together, touched like, like two cautious fish meeting in a dark pool and touching mouths to substantiate identical species. The other moral was satisfied with my identity. It leapt frantically at me, raced around me, through me, finally stopped, pervading me, while vibrating in sheer relief and happiness. I felt the great fear loneliness in the other moral begin to recede, and in its place came an almost overpowering euphoria. It was contentment, and it stemmed from the basic emotion love. I knew this at once. I suddenly realized that I too was relieved that I was no longer sick with fear loneliness. It was good, this existing of the other within me, or simultaneously with me. Or was it I within the other? It sated our fear emotion, and made, created, a love euphoria. I am happy I found you, I communicated. I was lonely for another morrow. You are a morrow. The other hesitated, thinking. No, I am Pat. I am different from you. But it is chiefly emotional. It is good. You are a Pat, I returned in disappointment. I had hoped to find another moral. Don't be disappointed, the Pat soothed. We are alike, really, almost so. Like, like flame and gas are both substance, yet different. We are two types of the same thing. I am no longer frightened. I am no longer lonely. You are good for me. I was relieved because I wanted to be. I believed the other moral, no, the pat, because I wanted to believe. I did not bother to rationalize. I felt elation. Then in the other time, that other place we both belonged to a... A common group with another name i suggested i believe so the pat answered how was it when you came awake i asked can you remember i think so i recall i was born here in fright because it was all wrong i was not in my natural state so it was not right 
the pat paused to think i remember there was great speed and i was born in fright were you no i answered i was not frightened at first i was never frightened to the degree you were i was mostly lonely which is related to fear but when i first conceived my existence here i was coolly logical i awakened reasoning realizing that i existed i suppose it has to do with our emotional differences the pat beside me or with me or within me communicated do you recall where in space you came from i asked i must have been doubting my existence at first so intensely that i did not observe you seem to have taken your own being for granted thus you were perhaps more observant i i think so the pat hesitated and i knew it was observing the stars around us yes come with me i think i know where i stayed with the pat a part of it and we lurched through space rather we ceased to exist at one point in space and existed in another how far distances meant nothing it was here the pat informed me finally something was wrong here the interweaving waves of force were all wrong there was a disorder a great cancer in space the waves interfered with the progress of each other all along a great barrier it was not natural not like it was elsewhere something is wrong with the waves of force crossing this area they interfere with each other new forces are created do you detect it i communicated i feel it the pat answered it is a sickness in space like like our loneliness i knew the comparison was ridiculous but i let it pass you said you came alive at great speed i could have been traveling too we must have plunged into this barrier it seems to me that emotions must originate in a physical being perhaps reason could be free but not emotion i don't know but i have a theory i believe our physical self still exists somewhere in space the barrier perhaps interfered with the normal functioning of our mental equipment we exist at one point in space and we are thinking experiencing emotions at another point it's as if our minds are are broadcasting our thoughts and emotions far away from our physical selves either that or our rationales were torn free and only our emotions are broadcast does that sound logical yes the pat agreed i believe that is the answer i felt that the pat was pleased with my theory that it was greatly admiring my reasoning i also perceived that it had no idea what i meant by the explanation i did not mind you said you were moving at great speed i continued can you remember the line the direction you were traveling in the pat hesitated for a moment yes you perceive the star cluster there the triangular one my heading was in that direction but it was changing fast then we could find nothing by traveling toward the triangular cluster no i was moving in an arc in the direction of the distorted square cluster there do you see it yes i answered knowing that her use of the word c was unconscious that is cetus cetus the pat was startled how do you know that i don't know the name came to me it seems right to call it that it's it's all so frightening i had no time for pampering our emotions though i was at great peace with the pat so near me time might prove vital neither would it do any good to travel in the direction of cetus i said no no the pat communicated if there is any object of matter or force i was a part of in that other existence traveling through space it is in an arc the best we can do is take an arbitrary direction between the triangular cluster and the one called cetus and hope to intercept the object 
the other part of me, whatever it is. Come with me, I ordered. I discovered the object of mass hurling through space before the pat did. It was symmetrical and metallic. I tore myself away from my companion and darted to meet it. I discovered it was a shell, a hollow thing, and I passed inside. There was a room there. There were projections and circles of transparent matter. I experienced the symbol, dials. There were two other creatures seated close to the dials, things of matter, and their substance was protoplasm. But there was no rationale present in either of them. I examined the living matter of the smaller ones swiftly. Organs seemed poised in a suspended state. The creature I observed, housed in a protective shell, seemed paralyzed or dead. I remembered the word dead. Then the pat was with me again. I... I feel something, Marl. I am frightened. What are they? Those things there? They seem to be. I stopped communicating. The pat had disappeared. The thing of protoplasm nearest me was moving, but I was no longer interested. I remembered the pat had touched the upper extremity of the creature and had vanished, had ceased to be. The old sickness was back. I was lonely. I wanted the other entity. I could not, did not wish to exist without the pat. I darted frantically about the metal shell, here and there, searching, searching. Where was the pat? I screamed for it. I thought pat as far away as I could reach. But there was no reaction, no response at all. In my frenzy, I was back beside the creature of protoplasm before I realized it, near the one I had not yet examined. Perhaps they took her, I thought. It was not logical, but it was a hope. Hope is emotional. I was becoming more emotional than rational. I touched the larger of the two creatures, experimentally, moved cautiously inside it, searching, searching. Suddenly I was seized by a great force, an inexorable power that grasped me and wrenched me, tearing me from the point in space I had occupied a moment before. My perception blurred, but I was not frightened. Without the pat, I did not care what happened. I was intensely curious. So this is how it is, I reasoned in a flash, to cease to be, and I ceased to be. Marlowe shook his head. I must have dozed, he thought. He glanced at the chronometer on the console ahead. No, only a minute or two had elapsed since the last time he had checked. Sleepyhead, wake up and live. He looked to his right. Pat sat in the navigator's seat, smiling at him. I didn't sleep, honestly, he protested. We hit some sort of barrier back there. It knocked me out for a moment. I had the damnedest impression. Remember what you promised, she swiveled in the seat to face him. No more scientific lectures on the mysteries of space, or I'll return to Earth. You know my poor brain can't absorb it. You win, he grinned, running calloused fingers through his gray crew cut. He leaned forward and kissed her briefly. How did an old space hermit like me ever win a flower garden bride in the first place? They laughed together, and he felt secure within the metallic shell surrounding them, no longer alone. The end of Cogito Ergo Sum by John Forrester West.